today we go to headquarters, capital city of the human body. Everything that happens in the mind affects the body and everything that happens in the body affects the mind. In Revelation chapter 14 verse 1, the Bible says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. And in John chapter 1 verse 29, John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus coming, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Back to Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads, not on, in their foreheads. What does that mean? And how can that happen? We know that all God's biddings are his enablings. We know that Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 states that unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And we also know that in Jude 24, the Bible says, Now unto him who is able to present you faultless before his Father's glory with exceeding joy. So we know that the Bible promises that this is a possibility, having his Father's name written in their foreheads. So what's behind the forehead? Let's have a look and see what is behind the forehead. We know that's the brain. And so looking at the brain, we look at it from side on, and we look at the brain from top down, and we see, as we've looked at a few times this week, that it looks a little bit like a walnut. And behind the forehead is the prefrontal cortex. The whole top of the brain is called the cortex. This is the prefrontal cortex, meaning right here at the front. And so understanding the prefrontal cortex gives us a little bit of a window into how God can write his name, obviously, in there, in the prefrontal cortex. It's in the prefrontal cortex where our intellect is. It is in the prefrontal cortex where our reason powers reside. It is in the prefrontal cortex where judgment takes place. And in the prefrontal cortex is where what I call the most wonderful gift that God gave to mankind, it is the power of choice. And freedom is based on the ability to choose. God is not in every man. He gave mankind the choice to choose him or not to choose him. And this explains all the misery and woe that we see on planet Earth because some people choose not to know God, not to love God, and when they choose not to, they actually choose not to have all the wonderful things in life because the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 that, that in him is light. In him is no darkness at all. This is where God communicates with man. In Isaiah 1.18, the Bible says, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be crimson, they will be like wool. There's a transaction. And we've talked about the transaction this week where God says in Ezekiel, 36, 26, he says, I will take away your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You shall keep my judgments and you shall do them. Surely that is what is happening right in here, but it only can happen according to our will. Revelation 3.20, where God says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He knocks at the door of our intellect, our reason, and our judgment. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, he says, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Beautiful illustration of the intimacy with which God wants to know you and I. And in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16, we see a little glimpse of that intimacy where the Bible says, 
For what agreement has the Spirit of God or the temple of God with idols? Ye are the temple of the living God. For God hath said, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them, right inside. Surely these are the people where God has written his name inside, in the forehead. Let's go to Moses and let's define this name. So Moses, this is found in Exodus 33, 18. He says to God, I beseech you, show me your glory. Notice the word glory. Glory. And we remember what God said. He says, no man can see me and live. But he says, I will hide you in a cleft of the rock and my backward parts shall go before me. And let's go to Genesis, sorry, to Exodus 34, then 5 and 6, and we see what happens next. And the Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Name. And the Lord passed by before him. And declared the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, who will in no wise pardon the guilty. That's his glory. That's his name. It's the same thing. <laughs> what does he want to write in our Prefrontal cortex, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands. There's mercy again. Forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, who will in no wise pardon the guilty. It seems pretty clear-cut, doesn't it? But it is not. It is not. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due season. Humble yourself. Give. Give this to him. Choose to give that to him. Casting all your care upon him because he careth for you. Be sober. Here's the other picture. Be sober. Be vigilant. How do you be sober? Fresh air, sunshine. Nothing, nothing that will in any way interfere with our communication with God. And the stimulants do. Go to bed early, as we looked at yesterday. Whoa. 50% less cognitive performance in human beings that for 10 nights in a row have six hours sleep a night. It's a great deception because after six hours you feel okay. That's the deception. Be sober. You are not sober if you haven't had enough sleep. You are not sober. There are more car accidents to people falling asleep than to alcohol. And we think of being sober of not having alcohol, don't we? You see, when someone's falling asleep, they're out. But when someone's drunk, they do attempt to break. They do attempt to take the corner, but it's too wide. So there are more accidents that happen to lack of sleep. Be sober. Eat food that's going to nourish. Blessed are the princes that eat for strength, not for drunkenness, says Ecclesiastes. Hydration. Our brain can't function if it's dehydrated. 75% water from the neck down, 85% from the neck up. The first place to feel dehydration is here. Specifically your prefrontal cortex. Stress, worry, fear. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, God says, I have not given you the spirit of fear. So who has? I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, of a sound mind. What's a sound mind? A sound mind is a mind that has a correct functioning intellect, reason, and judgment. Can you see where the eight physical laws effectively can take this down? Very effectively take it down. So see, be sober. Be vigilant, knowing that your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeing whom he can devour. 
And the Bible says, whom resist? Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Hasn't God given us each other <laughs> to laugh together, to cry together? He's given us each other. Mm. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We say in Australia, we're all in the same boat. <laughs> we have the same strengths and weaknesses and God gave us each other that we can strengthen, that we can be helpful, that we can be merciful and gracious and long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. But first of all, God says, let me take away your stony heart. Mm. Let me put a heart of flesh back in you and allow me to write in there. And 2 Corinthians 3, 2 and 3 gives a beautiful illustration. Written not with ink with the finger of the living God, not on tables of stone, but on the fleshy tables of the heart. This is the key. But be sober, be vigilant, knowing that your adversary, the devil, has a roaring lion. He walketh about seeing whom he can devour. A man told me this story. It's a true story. He was there. He was in Africa. He was in the armoured vehicle. And they were going down the, around the games reserve, looking at the elephants and the giraffes and the rhinoceroses. And they came to a, a, a group of lions, two lions and two lionesses and little cubs. And they were just lying down, looking as if they were asleep. There's a sign in the back of the car, don't get out of the car. Mm -hmm. A Japanese tourist wanted a better shot. He slipped out the back quietly because he knew he shouldn't to get up close to have a shot of these very sleepy lions. The lion jumped up and devoured him. Before the drivers even knew what had happened. That was a sleeping lion. And how quickly he was devoured. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, knowing that your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeing whom he can devour. But then the Bible says, whom resist? Resist the devil and he will flee. Res whom resist? Stand fast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Because the great deceiver does not want God to write his name in your prefrontal cortex. He does not want that. And his most effective, effective tool is deception. You see, there was war in heaven. This is in Revelation 7, 12, verse 7. So in Revelation 12, verse 7, the Bible says, and there was war in heaven. The word, the word war comes from the Greek word debate. Because before any swords or shields or bombs are used, it starts in here. Isn't that right? Mm. And in our next presentation, we're going to be looking at the laws of the mind, and I will define that in more detail. There was war in heaven, and Michael, another name for Jesus. We know in uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, that Michael stands up. And there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Praise be to God. That great dragon called this that that great dragon was cast out, called this that old serpent, the devil and Satan. He was cast out. That that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which has deceived the whole world. That is far more effective than straight out lying. And what's the deception? Not as it seems. Do you remember when, when the devil was tempting Jesus in the desert and he took him to a high mountain and he said, cast yourself down because the Bible says he shall give his angels charge over thee. They shall bear thee up in their arms lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Have you noticed that that was a deception. 
But isn't that the word of God? Yes, it is. But he missed out an important bit. And isn't that what deception is? Maybe 90% truth, maybe 99% truth. What bit was missed out at Psalm 91? It says, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. That's the bit he missed out. Because then they shall bear thee up in their arms, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus would not even die like he said, get behind me, sir. That's what God wants to do. He wants to write his name in our prefrontal cortex. Because when he writes his name in our prefrontal cortex, then he walks in us. It says, he says, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they will be my people. And I looked and Noah Lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their forehead. And I heard a voice in heaven as the voice of many waters, as the voice of a great thunder, as the voice of many harpers harping with their harps. And they sang as it, as it were a new song. A new song. Isn't that what happens when the stone is taken away and the heart of flesh is put back? And they sang as it were a new song. Before the elders, before the beasts. And no man could learn that song save the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth, from down here. These are they that were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. And we know from Bible study that, uh, that they have the pure doctrine. These are they that follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. We're to start following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth right now. These are, the, these are they which were redeemed from amongst men, being the first fruits under God and under the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no God. They are without fault before the throne of God. I look at that and look at me and think, how could this possibly be? Mm. And then I remember Jude 24. Now unto him who is able. <laughs> who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. That, that's how it happens. And in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. That's how, by his mercies, that you present your bodies living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God as your reasonable servant. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. The stone's gone and the new heart is there and with the finger of the living God, his principles are written right there. The Bible says that ye may prove what is that good, acceptable and perfect will of God. You too. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse, verse 1, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing then that you are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Are we compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses? We looked in 2 Corinthians 3, 2 and 3. Yeah, ye are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. There's the witnesses. You know, the first witnesses are the people we live with in our home our children, their husbands, their wives. And then there's the neighbours. And then there's the relatives. And then there's the work, or the people you work with. And then there's the people you see once a year. I just had a call from a girl. And I haven't seen her for 10 years. I worked with her as a psychiatric nurse. Just thought I'd catch up. I said, oh, I'm in England at the moment. Oh, have fun. We'll catch up when we get back. Oh, well, I might see her every 10 years. Th these are the witnesses. People we see once a week. People we see once a, once a year. That's what we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. I want to go somewhere else now. We're going to go outside the planet. We're going to go to other worlds. And what's the devil's accusation? They cannot do it. They will never do it. 
in, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, it says, and I heard a voice in, I had a voice in heaven saying, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuses them before our God day and night. So his accusation to all the worlds is, ha, they'll never do it. He never sleeps. So when those accusations come into your mind, who is it? <laughs> Whom resist? Steadfast in the faith. You know what Ellen White says? When the devil comes in with these accusations, look what you've done. You're hopeless. You'll never do it. She says that's the very time to say it was for the very likes of me that Jesus died. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Mm -hmm. Claim. Mm -hmm. Claim the blood. Claim the blood of the Lamb. It is able to cleanse the blood of the Lamb. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives unto, unto death. Seeing then that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let's come back. Let's come back now to the body. Let's look at some other witnesses. It's our cells. It's every single cell, every single one of our 100 trillion cells in our body. But particularly we're looking about the 1 trillion that are living in here. They're, they're witnesses. They're witnesses as to how much air you're breathing. Do you remember how much more air we're going to get when we're breathing in fresh air? I mean, how much more energy per cell? 18 times more energy. They're witnesses as to whether the brain's getting sunshine through the eyes. Don't look at the sun, but just being out there. They're witnesses as to if anything's coming in that can mar the proper function of the human body. And remember, the great deceiver is going to tempt and deceive us. Our cells are witnesses as to how much sleep we've had. Our cells are witnesses as to how much we're exercising. Our cells are witnesses as to the food we're eating. Our cells are witnesses as to how much water we are drinking. Our massage therapists tell us when we massage a body, we can tell how much water they're drinking. We can tell if it's a nourished body. We can tell, well, it's pretty obvious, they can tell the exercised muscles compared to the not exercised muscles. I had a massage therapist tell me one day she massaged an 80 year old woman and she said, Wow, this body. And then she said to me the next day, I just massaged a 20-year-old body. Wow, it was a sad body. Our cells are witnesses. Our cells are witnesses of do we trust God? Because the Bible says in Isaiah 26 verse 3, Thou will keep him in perfect peace. He whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusts in thee. And do you remember the best thing you can do if ever you're stressed? 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks. Thank you, Father in heaven. I don't like it. But I'm thanking you because I know that out of this, you are able to turn all things out together for good for the, because I love you and I'm called according to your, to your purpose. So be wary of the great deceiver. So let's come back. We've gone right out. We've gone right in. Seeing then that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, that is a great cloud of witnesses, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, 100 trillion cells in the body, I think there's more stars. Seeing then that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Why does it so easily beset us? I'd like to suggest that maybe the stony heart wasn't given up. I'd like to suggest that we're not allowing God to dwell in us and walk in us. 
Proverbs 26, 14 says, A just man falls seven times again and he rises again. But when he's down, the great accuser is accusing. Look past that to Jesus, who is able, who is able to keep you from falling. Let him. The temptations are great. Remember that accuser of the brethren before our God day and night. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and run with patience the race set before us. Looking unto Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy set before him. What was the joy? Seeing us on the sea of glass. That's his joy. In that beautiful passage in Isaiah 53, verse 10, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to put him to grief, when thou hast made his soul an offering to sin. But the next verse says, But he shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. What's the travail of his soul? Seeing us, weak and erring as we do, looking under Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Wherefore consider him? who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your mind, for you have not yet resist, resisted under blood, striving against sin. Here's the battle. But let me define the battle even more. It takes up one third of the brain, prefrontal cortex. And it's not fully developed until the age of 30. That's why adults bind your children to your heart, whether they be your children or the neighbor's children or your nieces or nephews. Bind them to your heart. How do you bind them to your heart? You spend time with them. You work with them. You garden with them. You read to them and you listen. Listen to their little stories. Listen, listen, bind them to your heart. So that when they're teenagers and in their 20s, they'll make you their counsellor and guide. Mm -hmm. They need someone with a fully developed prefrontal cortex. Bind them to your heart because they need someone who is able, under the guidance of the great God of heaven, to give the wisdom that they need. It's not fully developed till the age of 30. Well, we've got something else in our brain. It's called the limbic system. And the limbic system is our emotional system. In fact, it's often called the e-brain, meaning the emotional brain. Our emotions, our thoughts and our feelings were designed by God to thread through the prefrontal cortex. This is the sieve. These are your board of senses. And the board of senses need the great God of heaven dwelling there and walking in there. But remember, God gave us the gift of choice. He desires us to come to him, to humble ourselves under him. That's when he can exalt us. On the right side of the prefrontal cortex, that's your right, is the I won't decision. On the, on the left side of the prefrontal cortex is the I will. And right in the middle is the I want. The highest function of the prefrontal cortex is foresight. So I'm going to give you an illustration of what we all experience. 
We all wake up in the morning. It's so nice and comfortable in bed. Yeah. Our first thoughts and feelings are usually, I'll stay a little longer. Is that right? Especially on the cool mornings, I'll stay a little longer. But as our reasoning awakens more, and as we talked about in the sleep lecture, we go into the chat room. Is that right? Oh, I've got a busy day. See what we're doing now? So we're looking ahead. I've got a busy day. I've got a few things on. I need to start planning for this. I actually need to get up. I need to. I need to give my whole life to God. I need to ask for his wisdom today. I need to drink my water. I need to have my lentils or millet cooking. I need to walk. I need to come to God by reading his word. So can you see this dialogue? It's all happening. The first emotion was, I won't get up quite yet, I will stay in bed. But after considering what I want out of this day, I make a decision, I won't stay in bed any longer, I will get up. Can you see the dialogue? We all go through the dialogue. But let's say we decide, I won't get up just yet, I will just lie a little bit longer and oh dear, we're falling back to sleep. But oh dear, we wake up and it's only time for a quick father, I give you my life today, running out the door, no time to read, oops, no time for water, ah, uh, I'm just going to have to grab a banana, but that, that, that. God communicates with us via our free prefrontal cortex. The devil tempts us through our limbic system. That's our thoughts and our feelings. And the dialogues happen often. There's a war. There was a war in heaven where Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and prevailed not. When we give our whole life to God, when we surrender our prefrontal cortex, when we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, we're on the winning side. Jesus said in, in John chapter 16, verse 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. Did everyone hear that? In the world you shall have tribulation. But he said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. You would never go into a battle without first putting your armour on. And there is a beautiful passage in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, where our armour is defined. Where the Bible says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. See, this is not a flesh and blood war. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand in that evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. His word is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, is the spirit of truth. So we've got Jesus, we've got the Bible, we've got the Holy Spirit, all truth. Having your loins girt about with truth and having the breastplate of righteousness. Do you remember that beautiful section that we've looked in Isaiah chapter 42 where God says, I have called you on righteousness, I will hold thine hand, I will keep thee. Breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. Above all, verse 16, What's above all? Now, that's pretty important, is that right? Above all, take the shield of faith. Do you remember we just looked at uh, First Peter 
and chapter 5. Whom resists steadfast in the faith? Above all, take the shield of faith. Now look at this next bit. 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 <laughs> Wherewith ye shall. This is not might. This is not maybe. <laughs> Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Praise God. The accuser of the brethren, they're the darts. They're the darts. Look at you. How could you ever be? I've spoken to a few people that have said, I can't be a medical missionary. I've got so many problems. I said, yeah, but you're alive. You should be dead. What's happened to you? Don't listen to the accuser of the brethren. Don't give him ear. As soon as they come, remember what you say? Yes, it was for the very likes of me that Jesus died. Mm. Mm. And God can turn all things out together for good. All things, even me. And I love him. And I'm called according to his purpose. He is my only hope. He is my all. And I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Mm. Mm -hmm. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You shall. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. Jesus died that I might live. Take the helmet of salvation. How important is the helmet of salvation? What's it protecting? The prefrontal, the prefrontal cortex. The helmet of salvation. That reminds me of a story in the Old Testament where a young man named David took his stones and his sling and he went to fight Goliath. They had a huge army of seasoned soldiers. And there's a young man. A young man. And when Goliath came down and saw him, Goliath was angry. You'll read this in Patriarch's Prophet. He was so angry, you know what he did to his helmet? Pushed it back. He pushed it back. And what did he reveal? He revealed a little spot where that stone went. Don't push your helmet back. Take the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Sharpen your swords. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible says the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow, and he's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Have you noticed? <laughs> Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. All things are naked and opened before the eyes of whom we have to do. We looked at Joseph briefly this week. In prison, he'd done nothing wrong. In prison. And yet he'd been so faithful in prison. Do you think he was tempted with discouragement? Mm. Terrible discouragement he was tempted with. And do you know what Patras and Prophet says? He cured his sorrow by listening to the sorrows of others. Ah. Oh. And let's fast forward. Finally, he's out. He interprets the dream. He's the only one that can. And he made sure that the Pharaoh knew it was the great God of heaven that had given him that dream. And the Pharaoh said, okay, thanks. I'm sure he said, go back, you Hebrew slave. But thank you very much. I need a man. I need a man that can build storehouses. In those seven years of plenty, ready for the seven years of drought, could not find a man. He did not want a Hebrew slave, but he could not find a man. 
And so he sent some private investigators to investigate Joseph. He was very taken with Joseph, his manner, the way he presented it, the accuracy. So we had to keep coming back to this Hebrew slave. Mm. He didn't want him because he was a Hebrew and he didn't want him because he was a slave. I wouldn't be surprised if he interviewed Potiphar because, you know, if Potiphar really thought he'd laid with his wife, he would have been dead that day. Potiphar had to honour his wife. I think the private investigators uh, questioned the jailer, questioned the guards, questioned prisoners, and what was the result? Flawless. This man in every situation was flawless. And in the book Patriots and Prophets, Ellen White says that when he was under Potiphar, Potiphar grew to love this young man and he was trained in many areas that were going to be coming in helpful when he was second to the ruler. We never know what God's got ahead. Be faithful right now in every tiny little way because neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. All things are naked and open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, or the Bible understands us, doesn't it? And run with patience the race set before us, looking under Jesus. He is the author and he is the finisher of our faith. Remember, where the joy of his heart. That's why he endured the cross, for the joy set before him, which is seeing us in great hardship, in great temptation, to say, no, I will not. I will not sin. Because he's able. He's able. The Bible says, prove all things, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Prove all things. Many people don't want to stay in God's workshop. <laughs> Trials and suffering are God's workshop. But that's where the gold is refined. And when the gold goes through the fire, does the gold get burnt? No, it does not. What gets burnt? The dross. Rubbish. And so when the Bible says, listing the armour, above all, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, sharpen your swords. And when the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. All things are naked and open before the eyes of whom we have to do. Then the Bible says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heaven, even Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession, for we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but who was in all points tempted like as we are, we are without sin. Mm. Now because of that, look at the next verse. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Boldly. That's not in hesitancy. And I would like to suggest that that is why Joseph was able to flee from the temptations of Potiphar's wife. She was probably the most beautiful woman in the realm because he went boldly to the throne of grace. Flee as a bird to the mountain, thou who art weary of sin. Flee from the presence of a man who you see that there's nothing godly in him. That's what the proverb says. When thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge, we have a choice. Mm. We have a choice. It's a beautiful gift that God gave to us. 
Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, even Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. That's a choice. For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy. You remember in the character of God where he says, what's the first character trait? Merciful, mm -hmm. gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands. Mercy's there twice. Mercy. Mercy when we don't deserve it. Mercy. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. That's with assurance. That's with faith. Faith is the ever. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of not sin, things not seen. If you can see it, it's not faith. And in Hebrews, that's Hebrews chapter eleven, verse one. And in verse six, it says, "And without faith, it is impossible to please God, mm -hmm. because He is the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him." Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and grace to help in every time of it. Because he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, he says, My grace is sufficient for thee. Mm. For my strength is made perfect in what? Weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities. That's a hard one. Yes. <laughs> Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities that the power of God may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses. For when I am weak, then I am strong. For you see your calling, brethren. First Corinthians one twenty six. For you see your calling, brethren, how not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, a call, but God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the things that are wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things that are mighty and base things, and things that are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Let him that glorieth glorify in me, saith the Lord. I want to now take you to Revelation 22, verse 4. But first of all, I'd like to remind you that when Moses said to God, I beseech you, show me your glory. What did God say? No man can see me and live. He was in the cloudy pillar by day. He was in the fire by night. He was in the burning bush. And then he was covered in the baby as Jesus no man can see him and live. It says, a body thou hast prepared me because no man can see him and live. But let's have a look at Revelation 22, verse 4. And they shall see his face. Mm. Did you see that? Yeah. And the next bit tells you why. Because his father's name is written in their forehead. What a beautiful promise is ours. Because Psalm, sorry, not Psalm, it's found in Christ Objects Lesson, page 347, transgression of physical law is transgression of the moral law. For God has written his law on every muscle, every faculty, which we, with which we have been entrusted, and every misuse of any part of our organism is a violation of that law. All should become intelligent as the human brain and how to keep it in the condition necessary to do the work of the Lord. And that's what we've been looking at this week, the human frame, and how to keep it in the condition necessary to do the work of the Lord. The relationship that exists between the spiritual life and the physical organism is the most important branches of education. Did you hear that? I'd like to add something to that. Surely the most neglected. 
the relationship between this physical organism and our spiritual life is one of the most important branches of education. No wonder God, God said in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, Know you not that you are the temple of God? Of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. It's a Bible principle. And then in first in First Corinthians chapter six, verse nineteen and twenty. What? In other words, exclamation mark. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So the relationship that exists between the physical organism and the spiritual life is one of the most important branches of education. The physical organism, this is the last sentence of this quote. The physical organism must be carefully preserved and developed. Preservation is not enough. How do we preserve it? There it is. <laughs> How do we develop? We don't just go for a morning walk. We go for the high-intensity interval training. <laughs> we, we don't just drink a few glasses. We drink the whole two to three litres, two litres if you're as big as me, more if you're more than me. I saw a young man come into the room before and he, he had to duck to get under that. Whoa. Under that doorway, I thought, that's a very tall young man. He'll need a little pit bull. <laughs> Physical organism needs to be carefully preserved. It is not enough and developed. That through humanity, the divine nature might be revealed in all of its fullness. Isn't that God's design? Ye are epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. That is our work, and what a privilege mm. it is to work <coughs> for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. <coughs> and what a privilege to allow him to write his name in Amphorance. Because, again, I'd like to stress, it is only by the mercies of God that we can present this temple of God this temple of God, presented to him every morning. Father, I'm yours. I never used to drink water. I never feel like drinking water. But you know what I found out? If I don't drink water, my body doesn't work well and my mind doesn't work well. So I went from drinking three glasses, if that, of water a day to drinking two litres of water a day and the headaches that plagued me are no more. Mm -hmm. God is looking for a people who will do it. God is looking for a people who will present their bodies living sacrifice. God is looking for a people who will carefully preserve, but not only preserve, develop. Develop the mind. Develop the body. Develop the relationship with Jesus. So that through humanity, his character, can be seen in all of its fullness to all the cloud of witnesses that are all around us. May our prayer be today, Father, take me on yours and show me, show me where you want me today. Mm. Let us close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the incredible promises that you've given us. Thank you so much for the privilege, Father, of allowing you to dwell in us, to walk in us, even to the point of writing your name in our foreheads. Father, we are each here because we all want that. We all want to be on that sea of glass with that 144,000, having your Father's name written in our forehead. We want to see your face face to face with our Redeemer, having our Father's name written in our foreheads. Thank you for that great honour. 
It's our prayer that this may be a reality in our lives and we pray it today in Jesus' name. Amen.